Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Again, welcome back uh, to this session. We are uh, crossing the Aegean to the other side from Lamia to Bithynia. My name is Tassos Palkostas. I am senior lecturer in Byzantine Material Culture at King's College London. Um, I guess I don't need to remind you to mute yourselves as far as I can see everybody is muted. We shall follow the same format. Questions, please in the uh, Q&A uh, box, and I will be reading them out later on for Suna. So our author in this session is uh, Suna Chaaptai, who is a historian uh, of the artistic and the cultural interactions in the Asian Mediterranean and the reflections on the built environment. Uh, she completed her PhD at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign under Robert Busserhout, who will be with us, of course, later on this afternoon. Um, her dissertation was on the transition of Bithynia from Byzantine to Ottoman rule. There is uh, Bob on the screen. <laughs> um, Suna has held fellowships at Koch University, at Dumbarton Oaks, at Cambridge here in the UK. Uh, she has participated in numerous excavations in Istanbul, most notably at the Pantocrator complex, uh, also at Edirne, uh, and across the Bosphorus at Kuchugiali. Uh, she is now a assistant professor in archaeology and architectural history in the Faculty of Architecture and Design at Bahçeşehir University in Istanbul. But actually, currently, and for the past three years, she has been fellow postdoctoral fellow with the ERC project Impact of the Ancient City. That's in the Faculty of Classics at Cambridge here. Um, and this is a project that looks at the afterlives of the classical cities of the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, Suna is currently writing a book on the cultural transition in medieval Anatolia during the age of the principalities. At the same time, she's co-editing two books, which will hopefully appear next year, 2022, one for CUP entitled Cities as Palimpsests, Erasure, Exposure, and Other Urban Responses in the Eastern Mediterranean, and another for the Greuther, Mapping Cities in the Middle East North Africa region, Visualizing the Untold Narratives of Heritage. But today she will present to us her recent book, which was published by IB Tories on the book in the booklet. It's on page 44. It is entitled The First Capital of the Ottoman Empire, the Religious, Architectural, and Social History of Bursa. Now, this, uh, this, is, in the, this is in the recent tradition of investigating, fairly recent tradition of investigating the, the, the meeting, the interaction uh, of Byzantine and Ottoman cultures. Uh, forsaking earlier one-sided narratives. And that's indeed, I thought, a very timely contribution to the study of early Ottoman culture and history, especially in view of current developments in Turkey and uh, the way uh, the past is enlisted in political discourse. Um, Soon study shows the wealth, demonstrates the wealth of architectural traditions and practices in Bursa, in, in Ottoman Bursa, uh, and there are cultural references which are mostly subsumed and obscured by later reconstructions. So it's not, I guess the situation is not as bad as in Lamia, as we just heard, but still the part of that heritage is not very visible. And as a result, there has been a lack of scholarly work. So this is precisely what Suna is doing in her book, trying to redress the balance, balance and bring all that evidence to the fore. So Suna, over to you. Tell us more about this great monograph on Bursa. Thank you so much, uh, Tasso, um, for this introduction. Um, I'm just trying to share my screen. That's fine. How does it look? Well, on, on my screen, the edges are cut off, but now it's okay, I think. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. It looks okay? 
Yep, yep. Okay, thank you so much uh, again for the introduction and also Petros for organizing this event that brought us together. Um, so my book uh, is about how the Ottomans made the city of Pursa, their Bursa. It deals uh, with the first uh, 100 years of the Ottomans as they came uh, to Bursa in 1326 and began mixing in with the local populace and their new urban setting to create a cultural identity uh, for themselves, both internally and externally. And the book itself, as you mentioned, uh, branches uh, out from my dissertation in which I examined the 14th century cultural transition from Byzantine to Ottoman rule and its reflection on the built environment in Bithynia. Um, the book itself took me two years to write and have it reviewed and published by Ivy Torres. And I think there were two major reasons that led me to write this book. The first one was my position in Cambridge with the project in which I examined the afterlives of classical cities and uh, under Christianity and Islam. And Bursa made such a good case for me just to go back to revisit some of my findings in my dissertation um, and to test, put them to a test um, and try to understand whether the city that we are looking at was actually, or how Ottoman or Turkish that city was when it was conquered and was being transformed by the early Ottomans in the 14th century. And then secondly, uh, there, uh, because no comprehensive study uh, exists examining the birth of the first uh, Ottoman capital. So I decided to narrow my lens uh, to Bursa, narrating the first century of Ottoman transformations taking place in the walled city, as well as in the suburbs to display the urban context that made Bursa the dynastic or the eternal capital of the Ottomans. And even after Edirne in Thrace or and later Constantinople functioned as Ottoman capitals, uh, Bursa always retained its spiritual and commercial importance. So in the book, excluding the um, intro, I have six chapters. Or the first one is focusing on uh, the rise of the Ottomans and Bursa as an Ottoman city. And in the second chapter, I look at the buildings that are especially classical and Byzantine buildings that are um, converted by the Ottomans uh, in, order to, in order to function as the mausolea or Friday mosques, as well as uh, some other non-confessional -conf uh, accommodations or conversions taking place in the bathhouse, uh, city gates, city walls, um, and palaces, and so on. And then in the third chapter, I made a distinction between the convent messages that we find in the Kulia complexes, those social religious complexes, as well as the Friday mosques. But in particular, I looked at the architectural practices or the details of the construction uh, techniques that we note on those buildings. And um, uh, finding um, uh, the, the different uh, uh, forms, uh, both uh, deriving from the local practices as well as uh, incoming forms from the Latinite Byzantium and, uh, and the Mamluks. Uh, and then in the fourth, I looked at uh, the roots and the context of the inverted key plan. This is uh, perhaps the, the most common building type that we, the plan that we note in the uh, buildings in Bursa. And instead of attributing the origins to the Rum Seljuk or Mongol Ilhanic practices, I decided to have a broader framework to discuss the emergence of this type uh, in the early Ottoman Bursa um, uh, perhaps driving from other uh, centers of influence or impact, such as the elite houses that we see in middle and late Byzantine period, as well as um, throne halls or the audience halls that we see in the Islamic courts, such as the Fatimids, Ayyubids, and the Mamluks. And then I have a section or a chapter on the memory and the mon monuments, as well as the idea of invisible Pursa uh, with which I conclude my book. And at the outset, I, I must mention that Pursa endured many fires, sieges and earthquakes, the most destructive one being in 1855. Given the then prevailing ethics of restoration in its aftermath, it is not surprising that the city that we is visible uh, today um, are almost as much the result of its 19th century restoration patronage as of the early Ottoman sultans. 
And also the period itself is labeled as the black hole by an Ottoman historian by the name of Colin Imber because of the lack of contemporaneous written accounts and the formation of the Ottoman state in Bursa. So um, I decided to use the buildings uh, and constructed landscapes as my cultural artifacts to argue that the Ottoman claim to Bursa constituted more of a transition or reconstruction than a forceful bloody takeover. This in a way challenges the view uh, with which both medieval and modern uh, historians have regarded the period as a, a triumphalist appropriation. I discussed instead that the Ottoman conquest of the city was gradual and the local population and its institutions were assimilated into the emerging state. And the existing classical and Byzantine urban fabric comprised of walls, gates, palace, monastic buildings, and bathhouses were appropriated or accommodated for practical purposes, but they were also employed as symbols of conquest and to demonstrate the continuity of earlier beliefs and traditions within the new uh, Ottoman context. Uh, the book's thematic organization owes much to scholarship by Didi Fairchild Ruggles on Hispano Umayyad Spain, um, in which he examines the social meaning of, meaning of the constructed landscape as it transitions from one culture and religion to another, um, using the themes of claiming, legitimizing, and inhabiting. And chapters two, three, and four revolve around those uh, themes or systems in that order. And to Ruggles's triad, I added a fourth dimension, the expansion of the city into suburban areas and control of the land, which is the focus of chapters five and six. Um, and then I have examined that the automization of the city was a twofold project. In the first stage, architectural conversions took place at sites of former Byzantine splendor with the attendant reuse and adaptation of Byzantine spaces. The Ottomans then transformed the existing urban order by adding new structures and reviving elements of the ancient uh, classical and Byzantine layers by moving outside this old city as early as the 1340s and crafting new neighborhoods that mimic or replicate the spatial visual uh, model of the old city. In other words, uh, Bursa's reinventors Ottomanized the past as they built their capital city into a metropolis. And during my research, uh, especially for the buildings that are not visible anymore, I used quite a bit of variety of uh, sources that are ranging from travelers' depictions of converted uh, Byzantine buildings, as, as I am showing you three different examples that are um, depicting the buildings uh, prior to the 1855 earthquake. I have also used endowment deeds uh, or vakuf charters uh, that are in a way functioning like the Byzantine typica of the monasteries and uh, epigraphic documents such as the one that you see over here. And, um, and for the buildings that, are, that have survived to us, I have especially examined the construction practices, um, the alternating brick and stone uh, details that you see on the screen. And I also studied the shift that we see towards the end of the 14th century with the reign of Bayezid I when they shift from alternating brick and stone to ashlar masonry. And I tried to elaborate further on this um, uh, workshop techniques. So to sum up, uh, as the empire's first capital city, uh, Bursa's Ottoman, Islamic, and Turkish identity has often been emphasized in uh, contemporary Turkish scholarship at the expense of other identities. In works of art and architectural historians, the city has often been portrayed as having an insignificant pre-Ottoman past as if the Ottomans created the city from scratch. Yet archeological sources, as well as visual and written sources uh, by travelers view a richer uh, and more accurate narrative of the city and its Ottoman inhabitation, making clear that the contributions of the past do not threaten the authenticity of the present, a richer and more accurate narrative of the city and its Ottoman accommodation emerges. Thank you so much, I'll stop here. Great.